Hey, Deuteronomy chapter 2. And I, I've i got so many things to talk about. I have no idea which direction to go after this. But I just, I don't know, this was on my mind. I I was reading it, and I loved it. And it's um, the description that and Moses is reciting this to the Israelites. The Deuteronomy is the end of Moses' life. It is. He is writing like his last will and testament. He's telling them, reminding them. He even reminds them of the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5 is a retelling of the Ten Commandments, which, and there's something interesting about it. I'm not sure exactly how it fits, but between Deut- uh, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, there's 88 chapters between those two uh, tellings of the Ten Commandments. I think it's interesting. Eight is the number for new life, new beginnings, and so on. Uh, but, and you're looking at something like the first and second coming of, of Jesus because he is the Word of God and so on. But anyway... Deuteronomy chapter 2. Oh, let's see here. Let's look in uh, verse 9. He's telling them in verse 8, uh, don't, you know, you can go to go through Edom, but don't take that land. I gave it to Esau. Verse 9, the Lord said unto me, distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land of possession, because I have given R unto the children of Lot for possession. R. I'm pretty sure was a giant. Verse 10, the Emims. This is a race of the giants. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a great or a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. We know who the Anakims are. They are the children of Anak. Anak was a giant. We, I don't think that we're told how big Anak was. But I think this guy was huge. And I think the race of these giants, I think, if you just, if you just want to know, I think Numbers chapter 13, where the report is given about what they saw in Canaan land, I think the report is accurate. They characterized themselves up against these giants, and they said, we're grasshoppers in their sight. Why not think that these men were telling the ratio of human to giant? Human to grasshopper, human to giant. Why not? Because we know, we know, um, where is it? Baal, Baal Beck, not Glenn Beck, his brother, Baal Beck. That was it. Baal Beck in, um, where is it? Jordan? One of those Middle Eastern nations, the largest quarried stones that exist on the planet make up the wall or the foundation of the wall around that town. And outside of that, there's this giant block that was quarried out from who knows where, miles away, delivered to the city, but never put in place. And everybody's scratching their head going, how did these uh, desert people with mules and buggies get this giant block of stone over here much less put it in place and build the lower part of a wall with it well you're dealing with people that are huge is what you're dealing with this is what i believe i believe the bible i think it's very simple when you understand where these giants came from who their daddy is who their fathers were. They were sons of God. They were angels who left their habitation. They were angels that God charged with folly. They are angels that are now locked up in prison awaiting trial and judgment. Uh, but anyway, the Emims dwelt therein in times past, a great a people great and many and tall as the Anakims which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. 
The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, another race of giants. But the children of Esau succeeded them when they destroyed when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Now rise up, said I, and get you over the brook Zered. And we went over the brook Zered in the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea. Until we were come over the brook Zered was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord sware unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from among the host until they were consumed. So it came to pass, verse 16, when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar. He must have been a pirate or something like that, okay? Uh, but anyway, pass over the coast of Ar and the coast of Moab this day. And when thou comest, verse 19, nigh over against the uh, children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for possession. Verse 20, that also was accounted a land of giants. And I want you to take this into consideration and keep this in your mind. For when someone who wants to be critical of God and the Bible and so on says, yeah, well, your God like killed uh, innocent men, women, and children. He called, he told Moses and them to murder those people in cold blood. They didn't do anything wrong. Listen to me. Those were not your ordinary next door neighbor, suburbanite men, women, and children. These were natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. These were animals, not, what's the word I'm looking for? Not um, in line for redemption of any kind because of who they were, because of who their fathers were. The giant, you never, you never see in the Bible an account of some nine, ten cubit tall giant bowing before the holy tabernacle and professing that the Lord Jehovah is God and there is no other and they want redemption. You don't see it. You don't see redemption in the giants. You see God's curse. And by the way, you see these giants hating God's people, hating them, despising them. Goliath cursed David by his gods, defied the armies of the living God. This uncircumcised Philistine as a lion and a bear, David referred to him as. He's, he's a prototype of the beast, people. The Bible is trying to wise us up a little bit as to the nature, the character of the beast, who he is, where did he come from, um, why can't he accept Jesus as his personal savior? He's a beast. That's why. Though he may have the appearance of a man, he is a beast all the same. Not able to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and not even wanting it. Okay. Uh, but anyway, that was also verse 20. That was also accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in an old time and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them. I got to turn the page here. The Lord destroyed them before them and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. Now I want you to ponder this and, and especially keep this in mind on, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm remembering the, um, the story that's told later on by Joshua concerning how many of the kings Moses killed and how many Joshua killed. Moses Kill, and think you got to keep keep this in mind. Moses um, represents Christ's first coming, Joshua his second coming. Anytime you have two, one following another, you, that's usually what you have. 
the first and second coming, like the former and latter reign, I think speaks of the first and second coming. David and Solomon, when you, look, when you view the life of those two men, David is the one who, I mean, he was, he was a bloody man. He, he, was a, he was a warrior. He killed his enemies. He destroyed all of the enemies. That's why he couldn't build the temple. So his son then is able to build the temple because he repre- Solomon, he represents the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years, and Christ is going to build his temple during that time. And think of it. I mean, there's even a number here that matches. Solomon had a thousand women. He had 700 wives, 200 concubines. So anytime you have a, like a, 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 a succession like that, you have the first and second coming of Christ. That's kind of what I see here. But here's, the, here's what I was trying to get across. Moses killed two. He killed Og and Sihon. The Bible then says that Joshua, after Moses died, Joshua took over. God allowed him to kill 31. Do the math. That's 33. Think about it. Think about the number of Freemasonry, 33, the number of, you know, that double eagle with that 33 and that triangle emblazoned with that crown and these, you know, the eagle spreading his wings over the 32 stars. There's 32 stars there and the eagle being the 33rd part. It's like, um, uh, who is it? Um, well, the king that was, that had his 32 other kings with him, 33. And they're fighting against uh, Judah, they're fighting against God's people and they fight up on a mountain, think Calvary and they lose. So they said, well, if he's the God of the mountain. He's probably not the God of the valley. So then they go to the valley to try to destroy God's people, and they lose. Think of the valley of Megiddo, Harmageddon. You see a prophecy, right? I just love this stuff. Anyway, you're looking, you're not just looking at history. When you read your Bible, especially in these passages, you're not just looking at something that's old and done away with and what do we have to know this stuff for, like algebra, right? You're looking at something that will happen. God is showing you the future by showing you the past. And people, to me, it's just very simple. If you want to believe God concerning things that have not even happened yet, you know, like, you know, going to heaven, salvation, eternal life, stuff like that. If you want to believe God about stuff that hasn't even happened yet, why wouldn't you believe God about things that has happened? Why wouldn't you believe that there were giants in the land? Why wouldn't you believe that 10 spies come back and they say, well, we can't go into that's a picture of the law. The law will tell you, listen, my friends, if you'll be honest, the law will tell you, sorry, you can't go to heaven. You're a murderer, adulterer, liar, stealer, idol worshiper, Sabbath breaker, covetous person. That's what you are. You can't go. Ten spies come back and say, we can't go. They'll kill us if we go. But there's no way in the world. We're, just, we're out here. We're all going to die. And then you have Joshua and Caleb, who the Bible in Numbers 14 specifically say they had a different spirit in them. Think about it. Joshua and Caleb represent the two laws that all the law hangs on. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's who they represent. And they are the only two who left Egypt who get to go in the promised land. Everybody else of the Israelites was born in the wilderness or they were below age or whatever. But they had a different spirit in them. And they said, we believe what God said. We believe God's word. We believe the Bible. The Bible said we can go. We, the Bible said that God was going to kill these guys and pave the way for us to go into that land. Why don't we just believe God and go? And, and, and that's, that's what I think about when I read these stories. Think about the 33 kings that were killed. Think about Jesus on the cross at what we suppose the age of 33 by the Passover and the, and the feast days and so on. It's reckoned. We know he was 30, and we know by the description of the Passover and so on 
that Jesus probably was 33, and it, it's a good match. But anyway, that's Jesus defeating. Listen, to, here, here it is. That's Jesus defeating all your enemies so you can go in. And I love this stuff. This Bible's right. It's cool. Uh, look at verse 23 of chapter 2. And the, and the Avims, which dwelt in Hazirim, even unto Eza, the uh, Kaftorims, which came forth out of Kaftor. That just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. Verse 24, rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. Now, you just wrap this around your heart. God has already told you, you're going to win. I will make sure that you win. I will make sure that you, and my brother-in-law, Steve, that built this room, he used to say this. God has already told them, I'm going to let you stomp a mud hole in him. That's what he used to say. And so I, I, gotta t I picked that phrase up. Never heard it before until I, when Lisa and I got married, I used to work with my brother-in-law. He was a little rough in his speech, but he said, ah, I stomp a mud hole in that guy. And so my daughter, Lindsay, when she was little, she heard me say that. And she came, one day, I don't remember what it was, but she started, she got mad at somebody at the store or something like that. And she said, my dad will stomp a mud hole at you. And I just going. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Stomp a mud hole, you know, splash, you know. Yeah, that's what my dad will do. Anyway, uh, look, at, look at verse 25. And folks, I, I want you to understand how, how much God loves you, how much he cares about you, how much he's willing to do for you. And you may think, you're the most insignificant, nothing, as far as Christian people are concerned. You may think that what little you do, if anything, that you think you do for God, pales into comparison to some big hot shot, you know, that's all, he's reaching billions of people. Let me tell you something. If you're a member of the body of Christ, and it doesn't matter if you are a hair follicle on the little toe of the body of Christ, you are the body of Christ. I've watched enough YouTube videos of wacko um, conspiracy theorist type people who love to elevate themselves, and they'll make these YouTube videos about some explosive revelation that they, they've got inside information. They have discovered this, this big secret that once they put this video out, they are pretty sure then that they're going to be on a list from the Illuminati, and they're going to be assassinated any day because I'm telling you, this information that I've got here is, is dangerous to the New World Order, and, and, they, and they've tried to kill me four or five times, and, and I just know I, no, I don't let them kill me. And I tell you, I'm a marked man because of this important information that I... Listen, I've heard enough of that stuff till I just, I'm just sick to my stomach at it. People just brag and boast about how big and important they are and how... What kind of big revelation and danger that the, the 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 Illuminati doesn't want me to tell you that we didn't land on the moon and I know that information and and they've tried to assassinate me they tried to burn my house down and my whole family's turned against me and and they're probably listening now and, uh, let me tell you something you're not dangerous because of whatever conspiracy theory you subscribe to you're not and let me just say this if you if you believe the hegelian dialect and i and i can see it they not only don't care what side of the aisle left or right that you sit on or how extreme you are they want you 
to be in opposition to other people on the earth because one of these days i think they're just going to let the opposites crash so knock yourself out on your conspiracy theories but let me tell you something you're not dangerous to the illuminati or the devil's kingdom or whatever because you subscribe to a conspiracy theory or you watch youtube videos you're not dangerous because of your theories about the earth or your theories about who the beast is or whatever you're not or what you think about ufos or whatever you're dangerous to the devil and his kingdom because you are a son of god you are part of the body of the lord jesus christ you are in christ and as such look at look at what he said here look at verse 25 of deuteronomy 2 this day will i begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee do you remember what rahab said to the two uh, spies that were there to spy out jericho rahab you got to understand in her line of work she probably heard lots of things okay do you remember do you remember this talking about pillow talk with ladies of the evening do you remember a prostitute during the 90s went telling news agencies or a reporter or something like that that she was with bill clinton's chief advisor dick morris and dick morris was telling her that he knew stuff about area 51 not here area 52 he doesn't know about that but area 51 that there was something there do you remember that roswell he's i mean he said something about roswell or ufos or area 51 or something like that and made big news rahab knew things because of her line of work and she told the spies she said look it's known in this town that you guys are coming and they've heard about your god and what's been going on and how og and sihon have just fallen over backwards and you destroyed their whole kingdoms took their cities it's known that and everybody in this town is scared to death of you guys and they're pretty sure that they're going to die and she said i don't want to die i want to be i want to be saved and god say listen to me people man or woman god saves harlots amen god saves whoremongers and it's all has to do with that red what was that that scarlet cord and that's that represents i think the blood of christ but anyway god said i'm going to put the fear of you in all of them they're going to be scared to death you're coming that's what i'm going to do and i'll tell you people when you are in christ you are in your bible you are in the spirit of god the spirit of god is in you the word of god is in you and I preached this at uh, the, the revival services last week where dragons live. And I talked about devils and, and how they act and how they operate. And they are beasts. And God put a fear of man in them. And the man is Jesus Christ. And folks, when you've got the word of God living and dwelling inside of you, devils fear you. They fear you because of who you are, who you represent. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ. They fear the word of God. And they don't, and you know how animals react when they're afraid. If they're able to, they'll run. If they're cornered, they'll puff themselves up, make themselves look real big. That's what happened with Frank. That's what happens with me.
That's what happens with me sometimes when I go to Kenya. It didn't happen the last time. Praise the Lord. But it happens. But just remember, they were afraid of you first before you got afraid of them. All right? And that's why they did what they did. But anyway, oh, let's see here. Let's go down to uh, verse 30. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his, his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. God is in charge even of the evil giant king. Somebody say amen. God's in charge. God hardened this king's heart, this giant, this evil beast giant, this, what is he like? 14, 15 feet tall, God hardened his heart, made him obstinate. He said, I'll kill them Jews. I ain't scared of them. And God said, I did that on purpose. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give Zihon and his land before thee, begin to possess that thou may inherit his land. Now here's something I want to throw in here. What time is it? Canaan land the promised land is a picture of heaven. It is a picture of Jerusalem above and its inhabitants. And one third of those inhabitants aren't going to live there very much longer. God's going to cast them out and in the place where they had their estate, their habitation, God's going to let you move in. Woo! Amen! God is going to let you move into their estate. God's going to put them out and bring you in. Hallelujah! Amen! You can tell I've been in revival meeting all week. Just consider that, though, because that's what God did. God said, see all these inhabitants and all their cities and their wells and their fields and their orchards and all their little, you know, their, all their, everything they've got. I'm going to take them out, and I'm going to give it all to you, free of charge. So anyway, look at verse... Um, 32, then Sihon came out against us, and all his he and all his people to fight at Jahaz. And the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. See, he had something to remember. Giants reproduce. Okay? Giants reproduce. They give, they have children. They themselves, the first generation of giants, they are the direct offspring of these angels who left their estate, their habitation, they took them wives, all of which they chose. They mated with those wives, and out of those wives came giants. Those giants then, I would say more than likely, I would say, there, and I don't know that there is a verse that specifically says this, but my theory is that the giants, these first generation giants, themselves mated with human women. Because here's what you see. Um, we know, let's see here, it's not, it's uh, Og in uh, chapter 3, verse 11. We know that Og's bed was nine cubits long. Which equals out if you if you measure a cubit by about eighteen inches, which is about where well, that's my cubit. Okay, I have an eight inch hand here. That's a span, and this here is about ten inches. So it's about eighteen inches. Tip of my finger into my elbow. See so if you do the math on that, nine cubits times eighteen inches, that that brings out to about thirteen and a half feet tall. Okay? But anyway, even if you don't convert it to feet, you have Og being nine cubits. But then by the time David fights Goliath, Goliath is nowhere near that. He's only six cubits, which is still pretty stinking big, but not as big as Og was. 
And so just sort of typical, you know, how genetic traits happen. You have a giant marries a human woman. Their child is going to be a giant, albeit a little bit more of the human there than giant. And then that, that giant marries a human woman and their child also but you know the kind of decrease that's just my theory okay we just know that goliath was the the short one okay of the giants og was much bigger but anyway let's get back to this um verse 33 the lord our god delivered him before us and we smote him and his sons and all his people and we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men, the women, and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. Why? It would have to be. It would have to be one of two reasons or both reasons. Number one, that all of these inhabitants were corrupted by the giant genetic bloodline okay that's that's one theory that these the all the inhabitants had been corrupted this way of and, and when you look at the report of the of the spies they basically said these cities are full of these giants they never really said anything about, well, the leaders were giants, but the people were little like, like us. If you're dealing with just a king who is a giant, all the inhabitants of the city are just normal people, I don't know that you're really that worried about fighting them. But when you look in these cities and you see that everybody there is like, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 feet tall, then you're going... There's no way. Nah, huh? we're not going to do this. So that's one idea, was that they were all corrupted by this genetic bl giant bloodline. And as such, these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. That's theory number one. Number two is that they had whether or not they were of the giant genetics most definitely they had been corrupted by the religion of the giants and we have evidence of what that religion was one of the cities of the giants was called um Ashtaroth or named after Ashtaroth the goddess we also know that Goliath cursed David by his gods, plural. Think of Sodom and Gomorrah. How many children did God let live out of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities that he destroyed? How many children did he let live? None of them. Everybody was destroyed when God destroyed those cities. And so here we have, in these cities in the promised land, we have what looks like either they were all of the race of the giants or they were so corrupted by the influence of the giants, by the religion of the giants, by the wickedness of the giants, that God scheduled them for destruction. Now, let me just say this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Who is it that doesn't belong to God in the sense that he created them? He made them. They are for his pleasure. The creation and everybody and everything in it is under the authority and dominion of God, and God is the judge and the executioner of his judgment. 
in the last days. The wrath of God is going to be poured out on this planet without prejudice. In other words, God is going to pour out his wrath and destruction upon everybody on earth except those whom he has reserved. That's what, And is it not God's authority to do such a thing? And you know what's funny to me, funny in an ignorant way, is that the very people who would question the Bible about God sending in Joshua and in his armies to kill every man, woman, and child, these are the very same people who would endorse abortion and say, well, it's not really human. We can kill it if we want to. It's that woman's, it's her body. She can do with it what she wants. See, they don't mind giving a woman the authority to have her baby ripped to shreds by a doctor and have the government pay for it. But how dare we speak of a God who actually does have authority over everything on this planet? How dare we think God has the right to judge those people and have them destroyed if he so chooses? It's God's people. It's God's decision. God is wise. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. We get this idea from the scriptures that God is sovereign, that he rules over all mankind, and God brings in and God puts out. God gives life and God takes life. And it's based upon his law, his judgment, not ours. Um, verse 35, only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves and the spoil of the cities which we took. In other words, God let them have the cattle. God let them have the gold, the silver, Whatever it was that was left in that city, God let them have it. And then God gave them the cities. And um, I think they divided that up. But anyway, we get to chapter 3. What time is it? I'm not got any, anywhere near where I was going to go today. But anyway, I'm having a good time in the Word. And then we turned and went up the way to uh, Bashan and Og. The king of Bashan came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrei. Now think about it. Anytime you, have, anytime you have a battle between the bad guys and the good guys, you always think like cavalry or Armageddon. That's, you're getting a, a foreshadow of that. Here, Og represents the beast. Sion, king of the Amorites, represents the beast. The 31 other kings that were destroyed by Joshua think beast. The five kings that uh, are mentioned in Joshua chapter 10, king of Eglon, the king of Jarmish, the king of Jerusalem, which to me is interesting. Because if I remember right, the Merovingian bloodline, you know, from, from the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Da Vinci Code and uh, what was that book written? Uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Um, that kind of was the basis for Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. J.R. Church based a book. Um, what was He wrote a book about the Merovingian bloodline. But supposedly the Habsburg dynasty, and I can't remember what all the other names are, but there's this lineage of, of God slash kings that have ruled over uh, European nations like France and so on, and supposedly King Juan Carlos of Spain is given the title of, you know, I haven't done this one yet, is given the title of King of Jerusalem. And the theory is that that makes him like a Christ figure. I, I don't know. Maybe it, maybe that's what they're thinking. I think it falls more along the line of one of the five kings that Joshua had killed. And I'm reasonably sure I would just, because what we know God said, I think these kings were giant kings. I think they were giants. And this king of Jerusalem was one of these hybrid creatures, part human, part little G God, 
and was given the title of king of Jerusalem. He was the king of Jerusalem before Joshua and his armies moved in. And again, you just think, think, you know, think heaven. God, here we have Satan says, I will be like the most high, and yet God casts him out along with his angels. But anyway, um, God said in verse 2, chapter 3, And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people. Man, think about that. Here God tells you, fear not. Now, if you tell me, if I'm really, really, really worried about something, and you come up to me, rub my back, and pat me on, and, and hold me tight and say, Mike, don't fear that. Instantly I go, wow, I don't, I don't fear him anymore. Thanks. I've, wow. No, that ain't, that is not me. Okay. That is not, not, not me. Um, if I'm afraid of something, you saying to me, now Mike, don't be afraid. That don't work very well, does it? Let's be honest, right? I mean, it's good to get the encouragement from people. But it really, really kind of does little to drive away our anxieties and our fears about certain situations, certain things we got to face, certain things we got to deal with. But let me say this to you. If God were to say to you, fear not, you know what would happen instantly? You wouldn't be afraid. See, God's word has power in it. It is alive. It is quick. And it is powerful. And if God sends his word out, it doesn't come back to him saying, well, God, you gave it a good shot. You told him to fear not, but it just didn't stick this time. Maybe they just didn't release enough positive energy for you, or they didn't attract it right well enough. That is not what happens. When God sends his word out, it does not return to him void. It accomplishes the thing that he sent it to do. Seek ye out the book, people, and read, God says. And if God says to you, fear him not, instantaneously, you're not going to be afraid. God has the ability to take away from us fear. So, and you know, we all have this this mindset about, you know, what's going to happen in the last days and the, you know, the Illuminati and the New World Order, they're going to come and get us and they're going to put us in the trucks and take us to the camps and we're going to be in the concentration camps and be gassed in the ovens and, and I don't know if I can, you know, who who in here is a Christian? You know, I'll kill you if you're a Christian. Admit it. And and you're afraid. You're afraid that you're going to fold and you're going to go, "Not me. I'm not a Christian." I'm not. You're afraid of that. Don't be. Because if you are really God's child and God says to you, fear not, be dis- do not be dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For this battle is not yours, but God's. If God says that to you, he's going to take away all your fear and you're going to be like David looking at Goliath and say, listen here, Goliath, this day I'm going to climb up on top of thee and I'm going to take thine head from off thy shoulders and ain't a thing you can do about it. Okay, that's what's going to happen. When God says to you, fear not, I promise you, you're not going to be afraid. And that's what he said. Fear, and the Lord said unto me, fear not, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And you know what? Joshua just believed it. Or Moses. Moses just believed it. Moses said, Lord, you know what? I believe you. Okay, yet I will do it. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote them until none was left to him remaining. We got every stinking one of them. And we took all his cities at that time, and there was not a city which we took not from them. And there's a six here, by the way. Three score cities. That's... 60. Think about it. Think about it. Are we going to say, are you and I, and then I'm, I'm going to change here. I'm going to go to some things I was going to look at today. Are you and I going to be, if, if we are of that generation that sees these things come to pass, 
are you and I going to be faced with seeing the man of sin, the son of perdition, revealed? If, let's say that that happens in, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now. Let's say it happens, oh, let's give a good Bible number. Let's say it happens 11 years from now. I'm just making that up, but let's let's just say. And you and I are not slated to be killed or otherwise dead any time in that 11 years. Let's say that, that we are going to be alive. Are we going to see the man of sin revealed, the son of perdition? I think so. I think so. Second Thessalonians. I, I think Second Thessalonians doesn't need help from the Bible changers like um, Jimmy Swaggart, Donnie Swaggart, and others of that ilk, others of that kind, because they don't they they don't like how the King James words this. They don't like it. It doesn't match their uh, their charts. They would have to, if they were to just believe Second Thessalonians the way it's written, they would have to redraw their chart, have them all reprinted, and then send out an apology to everybody for lying about it and all that. Because and that's going to cost money, and that would that we'd lose donors, and we can't do that. So we're just going to change the Bible, make it say something. Let's read this Second Thessalonians two. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's what he's talking about, our gathering together. That you be not soon shaken in mind. See, he's telling you what? Fear not. Or be troubled, neither by spirit, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, that does not mean, people, it does not mean that if we ever have fear, well, you got a negative, you got a negative heart, and you can't, you can't release God with that. That doesn't mean that at all. There will be, just like Frank wrote me, and just like, just like what I experience from time to time, there will be devils on you. And how do we overcome evil? We overcome evil with good. We cry out unto the Lord, and God hears us when we cry, and God delivers us. That's how it works. God gives us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we just get into this little mindset that says, you know what, God? Let's do this thing. I, I don't really care how it turns out because I know you're going to turn it out. So, God, whatever you choose to do, that is fine and dandy and hunky-dory with me. You just do it. God, let's roll. Let's, let's do this thing. That you, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as, as from us. You know, like it says, Second Thessalonians, the second epistle of Paul, the apostle, the Second Thessalonians. But we retranslated it to make it say what it didn't say. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come the rapture first does not say that a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition i just it it says what it says i believe what it says you might disagree with what I think about this, but I tell you what we'll do. Why don't you and I just wait to see what happens? That way, when God does whatever he wants to do, neither you nor I will gloat over it. I was right. I told you. I told you I was right. You got it wrong. God's going to let me be first in the rapture, not Let's leave that stuff to the elementary school kids. Amen? Okay?